All right, let's get started. Good evening, my name is Daniel Southern. Uh, my practice is known as Interventional Orthopedics CT. Uh, we're in Connecticut. And uh, tonight we're gonna talk about the uh, treatment of sports injuries and how to avoid an injury progressing to post-traumatic arthritis. And we'll discuss exactly what that is. Hopefully we're gonna introduce you to a lot of new terms tonight and uh, ultimately to a whole new field of medicine. That's really the point of uh, tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, one of the pleasures of being a physician is uh, the uh, uh, diagnosis that you have to make. And this is a detective story. It's, uh, you know, uh, when you look at an x-ray that um, is uh, looks like this, and you see a completely destroyed hip joint uh, uh, as opposed to a rather normal looking hip joint. This joint's completely destroyed. You have to ask yourself, well, why this joint? And there's a number of factors that you consider, but uh, one of the main ones is the history gives you a clue. And usually that clue is that there was an injury uh, at some point, or there was a surgery, which is another form of injury that can be thought of that way. It's certainly a controlled injury, but nonetheless an injury to a joint. And um, uh, injury is a uh, past medical history that predisposes to joint degeneration that can lead to this type of total destruction of a joint, as we see pictured here. Sports injuries are injuries to muscles, tendons, ligaments, bones, fascia, and joints. Specifically, when we say joints, we mean cartilage. And of course, sports injuries can occur outside of playing sports. Uh, they can occur with wear and tear. They can occur with a trip and fall, stepping off the curb awkwardly, um, helping your friend move a couch. Uh, you know, these types of things can all uh, contribute to what is known in the business as a sports injury. And uh, one thing all these uh, tissues here have in common is that they all have a poor blood supply. And that's important to know because that's a great impediment towards healing uh, for any injury to any of these tissues. Uh, sprains uh, occur to ligaments. Ligaments are sprained. Uh, and this is a uh, stress to connective tissue causing uh, quite typically subcatastrophic failure. What's catastrophic failure? Well, that's when you rip a, rip a ligament or a tendon completely apart. And uh, if you're ripping your, uh, uh, your heel cord, for example, you can't stand. Uh, but that, that's not nearly as common as uh, uh, lesser uh, injuries, including microscopic breaks. And what, what this means is that the, the connection between uh, collagen proteins have been torn uh, on a microscopic level. But nonetheless, it results in symptoms. It can result in instability and lax ligaments and tendons. Um, strains are something that happen to tendons, uh, muscles, uh, and muscles. Uh, tendons and muscles are strained, uh, ligaments are sprained. That's always a tough one to remember, I know. But the, the same thing is happening here. Uh, on a microscopic level, you're tearing connections between collagen proteins. And uh, uh, this is a spectrum of tears, um, uh, which includes uh, a macroscopic injury up to a complete rupture. In other words, a tendon or a ligament or a muscle can be partially torn rather than completely torn apart so that you've got, you know, uh, one half here, another half here, and uh, nothing in between. Um, those are dramatic injuries. Uh, the, the broad spectrum of injuries short of that are uh, uh, partial tears is what we call them. The stages of healing here. Um, the first stage is inflammation. This is how your body heals itself through inflammation. This is the first stage of healing. And it's arguably the most important, which is why in my practice, we caution against the overuse of anti-inflammatories when you've done something bad that causes injury. We, we much prefer to recommend Tylenol, which is the only uh, pain reliever you can buy over the counter that is not an anti-inflammatory. Uh, the amount of inflammation at following an acute injury uh, is roughly uh, proportional to the effectiveness of later stages of healing. So it's kind of important to let uh, acute inflammation run its course. And this is a, this illustrates the difference between good inflammation and bad inflammation. Acute inflammation is good inflammation. You need to let that run. Bad inflammation is chronic inflammation. And of course, chronic inflammation is what will probably kill us all. Uh, when we get older, we develop chronic inflammation and that, uh, that destroys the joints and eventually uh, ourselves. 
The second phase of healing is proliferation. Uh, this lasts from weeks to several months, whereas inflammation is days to weeks. Proliferation is a longer stage. It's the second stage. Uh, in this stage, there is a proliferation of the production of a new protein in the area of damage and injury. And primarily, we're talking collagen protein. Most importantly, this is the stage of angiogenesis. And we're going to talk more about this. And this is uh, angiogenesis means uh, the formation of new blood vessels in the area of damage. And this is a key to normal healing. And it occurs during this phase known as proliferation. The final phase is known as remodeling. This is the longest phase. It goes from months to several years. Uh, and this is the uh, rearrangement and realignment of tissues that have been produced during the proliferative phase into the final mature form with very strong connections between uh, the collagen protein fibers. How do injuries heal? Uh, the answer are two words, blood flow. Um, in acute injuries, tissue is torn, bleeding occurs, and the blood brings in repair cells. These are native repair cells that exist in the human body. And bleeding brings in repair cells to damaged tissues, and it sets off this you know, healing process, which begins with inflammation. Primarily, it begins via a small cell that circulates in the peripheral blood known as a platelet. Uh, this is a remarkable cell. It's one of two forms of repair cells in the human body. It's the first cell to arrive at any uh, area of injury. And of course, its first job is to form a blood clot so that if you've actually torn blood vessels, as often happens during an injury, you don't bleed to death or you don't bleed excessively. Uh, right on the heels of that is the secretion of powerful cell signaling molecules known as cytokines, which start the first uh, step in healing, which is inflammation. Now, the amount of blood flow dictates healing time. And that's why there is a declension in the amount of time it takes for these various tissues to heal. And that's directly correlated to the amount of blood supply in that tissue. Now, muscles have a lot of blood supply. So they tend, when you injure a muscle, they tend to heal in days to weeks. In other words, fairly rapidly. Uh, bone is also uh, uh, fairly well supplied, relatively speaking, um, with uh, blood vessels. And if you break a bone, it heals in weeks to months. Ligaments and tendons, on the other hand, have a very poor blood supply, relatively speaking here. And so, you know, it takes months for these things to heal, if they ever do, depending on the size of the uh, injury. And there are areas in cartilage which simply do not heal, and they do not heal because there is no blood supply to that area. And this is where the expression, it's better to break a bone rather than tear a ligament comes from, because you got a better blood supply in bone. Bone will heal itself. Ligaments, eh, it's mezzo mezzo. It may not heal. Angiogenesis, here we are again with that term, comes from angio, which means it's Latin for blood vessel, and genesis, which means mode of formation. So angiogenesis means the formation of blood vessels. And again, this is the key uh, to the ultimate healing of tissues that have been injured. Uh, angiogenesis occurs, uh, as we said earlier, during the proliferative phase of healing, uh, and it's extremely important for normal healing. Any disturbance or failure of angiogenesis results in abnormal healing. And we're talking a broad spectrum of failure here, meaning, you know, sometimes there's just not enough new blood formation. Uh, quite often that is the case, particularly with orthopedic tissues that we discussed earlier, all of which have a relatively poor blood supply. So angiogenesis is key. Uh, anything you can do to increase angiogenesis following an injury is going to increase your chances of full recovery from that injury. How do sports injuries lead to arthritis? There is an entity known as chronic post-traumatic arthritis. And that can result in an ankle joint that looks like this on the left. This ankle joint is normal. This one on the left is pretty much gone. That's pretty much end stage arthritis. There's no longer any joint space there. This can occur after, oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, the, the picture that we see uh, here of this ankle joint can occur after say, uh, jumping off a fence at the age of 10 and badly spraining your ankle so that you couldn't walk right for several weeks to a month or so. 
and you got better and, you know, time went by and you didn't think about it. But, uh, you know, your ankle starts to hurt at the, you know, early 40s and you come into a doctor's office at the age of 43 and he takes an x-ray and this is what that joint looks like. And if you tell him, you know, the spectacular injury you had to it, well, he'll say, oh, yeah, right, that's post-traumatic arthritis. This can progress from the point of injury or it can occur, occur after a long latency period, like we just mentioned. You know, you injure yourself in your uh, early childhood, and then uh, in your late 30s, early 40s, uh, suddenly you got a joint that's very arthritic. Well, how did that happen? Well, it happened from the injury. What is arthritis? In a word, arthritis is joint degeneration. Arthritis begins in the cartilage covering the articular surfaces of a bone. And once the cartilage is broken down, the underlying bone begins to be destroyed. And it's usually at that stage, as the bone becomes involved, that's when a patient becomes symptomatic. This is when they go, wow, my knee is killing me. What's going on here? And they come to the doctor at that point. How do sports injuries lead to arthritis? Well, Sports injuries can result in cell death. And we're talking about cells here specifically, uh, according to the schematic we're showing you, uh, we're talking about cells here that uh, uh, are alive in cartilage and they're known as chondrocytes, but it could be cells that are alive in tendons known as tenocytes, <coughs> cells that are alive in ligaments known as fibrocytes. Um, sports injuries lead to cell death and uh, it's these cells which keep your tissues healthy. Chondrocytes, in particular, keep your cartilage healthy. And it only makes sense that if you're killing cells, you're reducing the capacity for that tissue to repair or regenerate itself. And this is simply a schematic showing healthy uh, chondrocytes and cartilage uh, progressing to, car to chondrocyte death, uh, matrix breakdown, and a divot right here in this uh, beautiful cartilage in any joint in the body. Uh, sports injuries also lead to damage in ligaments and tendons. And of course, ligaments and tendons are the static stabilizers of any joint. And if you damage the static stabilizers, you can cause a joint to become unstable. And instability leads to a chronic injury model of joint functioning. What does that mean? It means that the joint is slipping and sliding, as demonstrated by this schematic here. Every time you bend or extend that joint, it slips a little bit beyond what it should normally. And this results in repetitive micro trauma with joint motion because ligaments and tendons keep a joint stable. They're one of the two uh, stabilizing factors in any joint. And if they're damaged and you have instability, uh, this repetitive microtrauma over time leads to earlier breakdown of joint integrity. And finally, how do sports injuries lead to arthritis? Well, injuries can lead to chronic inflammation. And what chronic inflammation represents is a derangement of the chemical microenvironment inside of a joint. And that chemical microenvironment becomes destructive. In other words, cells start to die because of this environment, because you've got chronic inflammation inside the joint. And that leads, uh, cell death leads to a breakdown of the matrix, ultimately can lead to severe forms of arthritis as demonstrated in the hands shown here. So what is the standard treatment of uh, sports injuries? Standard treatment consists uh, initially of uh, triage, uh, and we call these police protocols. And police stands for protection. Optimal loading, ice, compression, and elevation. This used to be known as the RICE protocol, rest, ice, compression, elevation. It's changed now to police protocols. Protecting to protect the joint and the injury. Optimal loading. This is interesting. What we've learned with time is that you need to progress loading of that joint almost immediately. If you sprain an ankle, it's very painful to stand on it. You don't want to stand on it. So for a day or two, you're non-weight bearing. But as soon as you can, you're, you're, you're toe touch weight bearing and then you're weight bearing without walking. Uh, and this is important because that is a biophysical stimulus to joint repair. Um, the second phase of conservative treatment of any sports injury is, is that biophysical stimulation. 
And that's contained in this optimal loading, as we just mentioned, but primarily uh, it's contained in physical therapy where they're teaching you gentle stretching, range of motion exercises, progressive to, progressing to strengthening exercises. But there's a whole host of modalities here, cryotherapy, ultrasound, laser therapy, uh, primarily cold laser therapy and magnetic fields. This includes acupuncture, almost any modality you can think of. Uh, these are the uh, conservative approaches to trying to stimulate repair of damaged tissues through what is known collectively as biophysical stimulation. Now, biophysical stimulation primarily works in well-vascularized tissues that are expected to heal without surgery or as an, or as an adjunct to surgery. And remember what we said at the top here. Sports injuries are injuries to tissues that don't have great blood supply. So quite often conservative care of sports injuries is just not adequate enough. What is the ideal treatment of sports injuries? Well, we're gonna revisit this slide in just a second, but basically three factors. And the first one and most important perhaps is probably maximizing angiogenesis. That term again, angiogenesis, meaning you wanna maximize the formation of new blood uh, vessels to the damaged area. Because if you can bring more blood to damaged tissues, you can get a better healing process. Secondly, you want to change the destructive chemical microenvironment inside uh, that joint or that tissue that has been injured, which results in cell death, cartilage breakdown. And this is typically uh, chronic inflammation from inadequate healing. Finally, you want to increase stability. There's two ways to increase stability. One is through the static stabilizers. The static stabilizers of any joint are the ligaments, of the joint. They have no muscles attached to them. These are static stabilizers. And unfortunately, physical therapy doesn't really in, uh, address uh, ligament instability. Um, the other form of stability are the muscles. These are, are the dynamic stabilizers of any joint. And this is primarily why you are sent to physical therapy after you're injuring yourself, because we can strengthen muscles, that we can do. And that helps a lot with an injury that uh, results in instability. Um, because instability, as we know, will re result in ongoing microtrauma to tissues, which is only going to accelerate, accelerate chronic degenerative change. Let's look now at the traditional standard algorithm of a sports injury, okay? Sports injury is treated through acute triage. These are your police protocols that we dis just discussed, protection, optimal loading, ice, compression, elevation. And in the majority of cases it, with relatively minor injuries, this is gonna solve the problem. But if it doesn't and you go to your primary care doc, he's going to say, well, let's go to physical therapy. So I'll send you to physical therapy. And there you will get more intensive biophysical stimulation to try to stimulate a repair process inside these damaged tissue. Therapeutic exercise, ice, heat, electrical stimulation, laser therapy, et cetera, et cetera, including acupuncture. And this will solve the majority of any remaining uh, pain that most people have. But if it doesn't, and you go back to the primary care doc, he's going to say, well, go see my friend, the orthopedic. And the, you're going to go to the orthopedic, and the orthopedic is going to look at it and go, hey, well, let's do a steroid injection. Now, steroid injections. We'll talk about them briefly here because I'm not going to go on at great length uh, about them later. Steroid injections can, in a very transient manner, change the chemical and microenvironment inside uh, tissue damage or inside a joint that's been injured. Uh, it can suppress inflammation. It can be thought of as uh, foam on a fire. It kind of smothers it. But you know what? It doesn't completely put it out. So after two weeks to a month, maybe even a little bit longer, the foam disappears and that fire starts up again. And this is aside from the fact that steroids don't do anything to stimulate repair. They do, in fact, quite the opposite. Steroids are toxic. They kill the very cells we're trying to keep healthy after a sports injury. They kill chondrocytes that are alive in cartilage. They kill fibrocytes in, uh, that are alive in ligaments. They kill tenocytes that are alive in tendons. So ultimately, it's a really bad idea. And yet, it is the common stock and trade of any orthopedic in the country 
who's looking at an injury that tells them, oh, this is not a surgical case, but this patient needs help. What am I going to do for them? Well, I'll give them a steroid injection because ironically, steroids are the only form of injectate that all standard commercial insurances will pay for. So you have the steroid injection, it works or it doesn't work. Uh, maybe it works for uh, some time, uh, but then the, the joint or tissue starts bothering you again and you go back to the orthopedic and say, hey, hey, I had it, it worked for a while, but it didn't work anymore. What do we do now? Well, typically what will happen is they will order an MRI. Now, if you're standing in an orth orthopedic surgeon's office and you're looking at an MRI, your chances of getting surgery go up, you know, at least 90%. So this is where we are. This is the traditional algorithm up to here. Now, what have we done in this traditional algorithm? Well, in physical therapy, we've provided some biophysical stimulation towards repair, but it's all on top of the skin. It's very remote from the actual area of damage. So the stimulus is pretty poor. Also in physical therapy, what we've done is uh, we've strengthened the dynamic stabilizers of the area. We strengthened your muscles, but we haven't done anything for the static stabilizers, which are your ligaments. And moreover, we haven't done anything for the chemical microenvironment that's probably still alive in these tissues and that is probably accelerating degeneration in these tissues. So if you're unfortunate enough to get this far and you have surgery, one of the dirty secrets of surgery is that over time, it can lead to more surgery. And, you know, given more time after an initial damage and then a surgery for a joint, the ultimate treatment in orthopedics is a joint replacement. This is the standard treatment. So what's a better treatment? Well, let's go back to that slide. Again, we want to try to maximize angiogenesis which is the formation of new blood vessels. We want to change that destructive chemical microenvironment and we want to increase stability, not only in the muscles, but also in your ligaments, which are the static stabilizers. How are we gonna do that? Well, now I'm about to explain how that's done in this new field of medicine. In 2005, for the very first time on earth, medical doctors began treating orthopedic conditions using precise, stem cell injections. For stem cell, you can read repair cell because there are two forms of repair cells in the body, one of which is a stem cell. All of this represents a new medical specialty and it is known as interventional orthopedics. What the heck is that? What is interventional orthopedics? Well, it's probably best to describe it in relation to traditional orthopedics, wherein we use scalpels, drills, saws, in other words, a lot of tools to incise, cut, grind, amputate, uh, to place screws, plates, rods, nails, anchors, staples, sutures. The analogy here, the metaphor here is one of carpentry where, you know, we're doing carpentry. It's, I tell you, it's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm a, I enjoy, you know, hanging out in the garage and banging together some uh, project. But I don't know if it's the best approach towards uh, joint or tissue injury. In interventional regenerative orthopedics, what we're doing is we're just using needles. That's the only tool we use, uh, along with advanced imaging, ultrasound and fluoroscopy, which is real-time x-ray. Uh, and all we're doing is injecting. What are we injecting? We're injecting our patient's own blood and or repair cells. We're delivering growth factors directly to precise areas of damage in the tissues we're addressing. The metaphor here is one of gardening. In traditional orthopedics, what we're doing is we're removing and we are rearranging tissues. We are deconstructing and reconstructing. In other words, we're, we are replacing native structures ultimately, because remember, that's what total joint replacement is. It is the amputation of your native joint and replacement with a prosthesis. Interventional orthopedics, on the other hand, what we're doing is we're trying to stimulate repair and regrowth of tissue. Uh, what we're aiming to do is to preserve native structures. And I can't emphasize how huge that is because it's always better to preserve uh, uh, the native design of the human body, which quite frankly has been refined over many millenniums since humans have walked the face of the earth. 
And if you can do that, uh, if you can all, if you have to alter the design of this this design of the human body, which is a wonderful uh, uh, biophysical design, it comes at a cost. Always, always, it comes at a cost. So if you can avoid it, you you want to avoid it. The promise of interventional orthopedics: what we do is we use the body's ability to heal itself. Uh, this means that we're using our patient's own repair cells. We're concentrating them and focusing them very precisely. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of that. You need to place these repair cells in precise areas of damage. Uh, it is minimally invasive. All we're using is needles. Uh, we do not use scalpels. We do not use drills or saws. And what this does is it reduces or eliminates operative trauma. Uh, it uh, minimizes post-procedure recovery. And it results in a very much less painful rehabilitation and a much shorter rehabilitation. And the end result when we're successful is that you preserve native tissues. This is a schematic of the balancing act of a healthy joint. And there is always a balancing act between repair and maintenance and breakdown. In a healthy joint, you've got healthy chondrocytes, which are cells and live and cartilage. You've got controlled remodeling of cartilage. And what that means is that your cartilage is broken down and built back up on a regular basis. You may have heard that you have an entirely new skeleton every seven years. And that's because bone is being remodeled in the same way cartilage is remodeled. And it's a, it's a controlled breakdown and buildup. Um, you've got normal loads, normal stability. You've got normal bone cartilage interface. But when you have something that causes the death of cells, when you have something that results in uncontrolled cartilage breakdown, or you have excessive loads and instability, this leads to abnormal bone cartilage interface. And in other words, it finally leads to a painful joint. Here's another schematic showing the balancing act of forces that degrade a joint and forces that repair a joint. The forces that degrade a joint are those that break the joint down and pro-inflammatory uh, forces. So let's, let's look at a couple of those. Here's a knee with the dreaded picture of bone on bone and the uh, medial compartment of the knee. So this is a very arthritic joint. What's happening in this joint? Well, what's happening in this joint is that there are enzymes known as proteinases and peptidases. They go by names that are listed down here, MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases. And these enzymes are digesting the cartilage, resulting in this bone and on bone appearance of this knee. And the irony is that these enzymes are being secreted by the cells that are entrusted with keeping cartilage healthy. They are the cells alive inside of cartilage known as chondrocytes. But clearly there's something that has happened to derange these cells and they're over secreting these enzymes which are digesting the cartilage of this joint and thereby destroying it. Other factors that break down a joint, pro-inflammatory forces, what are these? These are agents inside the joint that usually come from chronic instability in joint following an injury or following the progression of uh, arthritis to the point of instability. And these inflammatory agents are known by several names, or many names. These are just a couple listed here. IL-1, which stands for interleukin one TNF-alpha stands for tumor necrosis factor alpha. And these inflammatory agents enhance the activity of the enzymes that are destroying your cartilage. So you can see how this is reinforcing. And, and believe me, what we're talking about here is chronic inflammation. This is bad inflammation. This is not the good inflammation that leads to repair. So what, uh, what do you do in life to contribute to these breakdown and pro-inflammatory forces? Well, as we've been talking about tonight, we're injury, injury to tissue and to a joint. Uh, resulting instability can lead you a long ways down the road to joint degeneration. Uh, obesity, which increases loading forces on a joint, that too can break down a joint very rapidly with time. Smoking, uh, you know, add to the long list of the terrible things that smoking does. You can add, uh, without a doubt, absolute destruction of um, orthopedic tissues, including uh, cartilage and joints. Poor diet does the same thing. Poor fitness uh, contributes to instability and muscle weakness, as does sedentary lifestyles. All of these factors 
or a subset of these factors can lead to increasing the forces that break down a joint and tip the balance of this teeter-totter towards joint degeneration. So let's talk now about some of the forces that resist that breakdown. Uh, some forces, uh, uh, these forces are known as anti-breakdown forces. And these are the forces that restore a healthy chemical microenvironment inside a joint. And this results in reduced cell death. What are these forces? Well, these are chemicals that counteract the pro-inflammatory environment and inhibit the enzymes that we just spoke about that are digesting your cartilage. The irony here is that in the past decade, we have discovered that in all human blood products, alive in serum are these chemicals known by some of the names listed here, interleukin receptor antagonist protein, IRAP, alpha-2 macroglobulin known as A2M, TIMP, which stands for tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases. These are substances that have only recently been discovered that are uh, present in all human serum uh, and what these uh, substances do is they can immediately change the chemical microenvironment and shift it from a one of destruction to one of health and pro-growth. So this is very important. Uh, and this reinforces the, the fact of what it is uh, doctors in this new field are doing. They're injecting human serum into joints and into tissues that are injured. Other forces that tip the balance towards health these are uh, buildup forces. Uh, in essence, what are they? They're growth hormones. Growth hormones that have resulted in a physique like this. But make no mistake here, we're not talking natural growth hormones here. This is somebody that's injecting growth hormones from the outside. No human body gets this look without adding growth hormone from the outside. But within every one of us, there are powerful growth hormones that work as cell signaling molecules that help to restore tissues after injury. They promote cell division and growth. And most importantly, they increase angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessels and damaged tissues. They stimulate protein and matrix secretion. And some of these growth hormones are known by these acronyms uh, down here. Uh, PDGF stands for platelet-derived growth factor. FGF stands for fibroblast growth factor. VEGF stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. And these are just three of uh, scores of growth factors that are uh, present in the human body. These are the forces that build up a joint or help to heal and repair tissues. Where do we find them? Well, we find them in our patients. These are patients' own self-repair tissues, autologous. It's a fancy word for self. Our patients' autologous repair tissues. There's two forms of repair cells in every human body. What we do is we we extract them, we concentrate them, and we manipulate them. In other words, place them at areas of injuries to deal with musculoskeletal injuries. Two forms of repair cells. One is a small cell that circulates in your peripheral blood. This is known as a platelet. So you may have heard of platelet-rich plasma. This is the preparation that we get from just a simple blood draw from a vein in your arm. Uh, the second is a more powerful uh, repair cell. It's known as an adult stem cell, uh, sometimes known as a mesenchymal stem cell, an MSC. Um, and uh, in my world, I get these exclusively from bone marrow. You can get them from adipose tissue, but that's a whole other presentation as to why uh, more properly we should get them from bone marrow. At any rate, these repair cells are known as orthobiologics, and that's from using a patient's biological tissues, biological cells, to treat orthopedic injuries, orthobiologics. Orthobiologic injection. So this is where we're injecting repair cells, either platelets or bone marrow, precisely into areas of damage. Worn cartilage, a bad bone cartilage interface, torn muscles, tendons, or cartilage, or ligaments. And to do this, the, the, the technique of doing this uh, requires uh, advanced imaging. We use ultrasound, which is just bouncing sound waves off tissues to get an image, or we use fluoroscopy, which is basically real-time x-ray, to precisely inject the rotator cuff tendon, the uh, medial glenohumeral ligament, the coracolacromial ligament, 
you know, we inject these precisely when we know that they're injured. You have to do this. Uh, this is how you affect repair. When you do this, you would stimulate an inflammatory repair process. What is the correct dose of repair cells? That's an excellent question. And the truth is, in stem cells, we don't really know. We don't really know. What we do know and what studies show is that you need a lot. In other words, the more, the merrier. In other words, go big or go home. How do we do that? Well, we maximize the harvest of these cells. In other words, we, we go into bone at multiple draw sites versus a single draw site because studies have shown clearly that multiple draw sites results in a better harvest of stem cells than a single draw site. And then you have the efficiency of the cell capture. And this is system dependent. In other words, what system, what platform are you using to concentrate these cells? In other words, what centrifuge do you have? What techniques are you using? And that's very important. Important uh, The number of cells you can capture once you have got bone marrow uh, from your patient. Uh, with platelets, it's different. Studies, recent studies have shown the correct dose to stimulate angiogenesis. There's that word again. We now know the correct dose of platelets required to stimulate the formation of new blood vessels, and this is huge. What is the dose needed? It is 1.6 billion platelets per milliliter. How do we find that? Well, if you have a procedure in my office, before we do any procedure, we uh, have you uh, get what is known as a CBC, which is a complete blood count. It's just a simple blood draw and the lab counts the number of platelets that you have. So we know what your baseline platelet count is. Uh, we multiply that baseline platelet count uh, times the amount of blood uh, drawn, times the capture rate of your system, and that gives us our dose. And again, the dose we're shooting for is 1.6 billion platelets per, micro, per milliliter, rather. And that's typically, because I'm shooting for that dose, when I know that dose is what I want and I know what the baseline platelet count of my patient is, then I know how much blood I need to draw. So that's the nuts and bolts of, uh, of how we arrive at the proper dose of platelets. But the proper dosing is very important and we've just recently discovered what that is. Let's go back to this uh, schematic. Uh, if you walk into my office and say you've got a sprain, you went hiking and you sprained the medial collateral ligament in your knee and you went to the orthopedic and he says, ah, yeah, you got a sprain. It's not torn. No problem. Just rest it. It'll be better. You rested it. You rested it. You did physical therapy. Uh, six months have gone by and you're just not better. You can't go hiking again and enough is enough. And you go back to the orthopedic and that's all he's telling you. Ah, no, nah, it's not surgery. You just got to, you got to give it more time. So if you walk into my office, I'll, you know, check the MRI, I'll look at it with ultrasound, and uh, I may tell you, hey, we need to do a PRP injection. So let's say we do a PRP injection. What is it we're getting with a PRP injection? We're getting a whole host of factors which are going to result in anti-breakdown of that tissue. In other words, we're alpha-2 macroglobulin is what we get. We get IRAP, we get two, uh, tumor growth factor beta, we get uh, TIMP. And we get some very powerful growth hormones, uh, notably platelet-derived growth factor. And quite often that's enough to heal a small uh, a, uh, ligament uh, sprain that just hasn't healed. Uh, when it's more than that, uh, say we you come into my office, you have an MRI that shows that a hamstring is partially torn and it's a pretty significant tear. Uh, but the orthopedic surgeon is still telling you, hey, hey, it's not a surgical case, just give it more time, but you're tired of giving it time and it's not better. Uh, I may say to you, well, you know, for this, I think we need to use stem cells. So we'll do a stem cell procedure, MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells that I get from you. And what do we get with that? Well, we get a whole host of powerful, powerful growth factors, VEG, VF, FGF, IGF, CXCL. And what these injections do is they put the finger on the scale. They tip the balance towards repair in your tissues, quite simply. One of the techniques we use, in fact, the exclusive technique we use is known as prolotherapy. The irony is that prolotherapy has been around for 90 years. Prolotherapy is defined as a growth factor or growth factor stimulating injection. What it does is it addresses CTI, which stands for connective tissue insufficiency. 
following injury, growth factor is elevated for a matter of days. And this is the natural process of inflammation after you injure yourself. Uh, but thereafter, healing is dependent on maturation of immature repair tissue. And quite often, the uh, presence of growth factor during uh, just a following simple, a simple injury is just not sufficient to lead to uh, uh, adequate repair. Uh, sometimes it leads to a, a chronic injury model. And uh, so you can think of what it is we're doing in interventional orthopedics as perhaps giving the area a second chance at healing uh, by bringing blood to the area. Prolotherapy raises the level of growth factors to resume or initiate repair. Now, traditionally, 90 years ago, what we were using was a uh, one of the things we were using. Uh, we were using simply irritant solutions. And one of the standard irritant solutions is sugar water, 12.5% dextrose. It's quite pro-inflammatory. You inject this into any connective tissue and it causes uh, exposed cells to produce growth factors. And this leads to a repair process, which results without a doubt uh, in thickening of ligaments and tendons. Uh, it enlarges the tendinosseous junction where these tendons and ligaments interdigitate with bone fibers. It stimulates repair of tears, increases stability. That's what you're doing. This is not magic. Uh, basic scientific bench work shows that, that this works. And it reduces the progression to post-traumatic arthritis. The revolution of what we're doing in interventional orthopedics is we're no longer using sugar water. We're using your repair cells, our patients' repair cells with the same techniques, which are the techniques of needle injection into precise areas of tissue damage. So let's look at one of those. This is the psoas tendon. This is the hip flexor and tendon. The hip flexor is the most powerful uh, and largest muscle in your body. Here is the ball joint. This white line is the ball joint of a hip. This is the uh, white line of the cup of the uh, hip joint. This white stuff over the top is the tendon of the hip flexor, which is coming over here and inserting down here somewhere uh, uh, into your inner thigh bone. And when you fire the muscle, this tendon pulls that bone up and flexes the hip. Well, you can see inside this tendon, there's a long, dark line. Well, that's a tear. That's a tear. So let's look at this in real time now. You're going to see the needle come in from up here, very faintly, into this area. And then you're going to see a flash of platelet-rich plasma, patient's own platelets being injected into this tear. Here we go. Here comes the needle. You can see it right here. Now we're inside this tear, and you'll wait for the flash. You'll see a flash of PRP into that tear. There it is. And this is on a loop, so it'll just show it again and again, but that's platelet going into the tear of this tendon to heal this injury. This is uh, something quite similar. This is a shoulder. Uh, this is the rotator cuff tendon. This is the uh, tendon in white here. This is the ball joint of the shoulder. The needle will come in here and you will see the injection of PRP into that tendon, which is torn. There's a needle. And you see the flash of, uh, there it is, PRP being injected into that tendon. This is ultrasound. This is what a doctor is looking at when he's using ultrasound. So uh, just to sum up, we perform precise image-guided stem cell and platelet procedures to treat a whole host of injury, headaches, neck pain, upper back pain, shoulder arthritis, rotator cuff tears, labral tears, uh, wrist arthritis and thumb arthritis, elbow arthritis, um, low back pain, sciatica, uh, facet syndrome, disc herniations, bulges, and stenosis. We treat hip arthritis and labral tears. We treat knee arthritis, meniscal tears, ACL tears, ankle arthritis. Pretty much, you know, no area of the body that we don't treat. Here's some further examples of interventional orthopedics. This is a setup in the procedure room. Uh, this is a C-arm. This is a fluoroscope haloed around a knee. That's a heavily draped knee. This here is an MRI of that knee. And what this MRI is showing us is that the kneecap has this white spot in it. Well, that's a bone lesion. And that, that white stuff is because the cartilage down here is fissuring and some of the joint fluid is being forced into the bone and this bone is beginning to die. So that has to be addressed. And you can see the cartilage here is breaking up over the distal thigh bone. So we have to inject here and we have to inject inside this bone. And what we're injecting are stem cells. And this is what uh, the, this fluoroscope is showing the operator here. 
This is a trocar that's been worked into the kneecap. And this is a needle that's injecting right behind the kneecap. This dark line is contrast dye showing the operator where the stem cells are going to go when he injects. So we're using a combination. We uh, use a stem cell, we use ultrasound rather to place these needles. Then we use a fluoroscope uh, to show us the dye flow pattern uh, of where we're injecting before we inject. So you can see it's very precise what we're doing here. This is the injection of a shoulder, uh, SLA. This is a superior labral tear, uh, otherwise known as a slap lesion. The first needle placement, this is a real time, it's on a loop and it's showing you over and over again. The, the first needle placement here is showing a, a dye, this dark line here, being injected into the glenohumeral joint, which is the main joint of your shoulder. The second placement is up here and you will see that there's a little triangular area of dye. Well, that's the labrum of the uh, shoulder joint. So it, this is a uh, real-time fluoroscopic view uh, showing you the precision that it requires to deal with a shoulder slap lesion. Um, this is the this is an interesting one. This is the median nerve. This is a cross section. The, near, the nerve is coming straight at us, and this is the the, the round uh, median nerve. And this is a needle coming in. And what we're doing is we're hydro dissecting around the median nerve. We do this for carpal tunnel. Uh, I'll do this to, to numb a hand before I inject, inject the basal joint. Uh, and this is what it looks like in real time. That's the needle coming in there. And we're injecting uh, PRP around this thing. And for scale, this is the size of a pea, a small green pea. So this shows you how precise this work is. Very precise, in other words. So why will interventional orthopedics replace elective orthopedic surgery? Well, three main reasons. It's less invasive. It uh, results in a quicker recovery. And we preserve native tissues when we can do that. And remember, it's always, always best to preserve native tissues if you can. Let's go back to this. I'd like to leave you with this. This is the traditional algorithm of orthopedic treatment of any injury uh, that we discussed earlier. And the injury changes when we consider uh, what it is that I do in my practice, interventional orthopedics. Algorithm is the same up until about here. When we get the MRI and we see some damage, if you're standing in my office as opposed to a surgeon's office, I'll say, well, heck, why don't we do a PRP or a stem cell injection? We'll do that. After we do that, I'll send you back to rehab to get you stronger. And when we're successful, what we've done is we've preserved your native tissues or your joints, you're healthy, you're back to the field of play, you're enjoying life again. And look what we've done. We've taken you out of this algorithm, which is pushing you towards surgery and to total joint replacement. The final thought I wanna leave you with is that what we do is not a terminal treatment. In other words, this is not a box that you go into and you can't exit from like total joint replacement. Total joint replacement is a box. You enter that box, you can't leave. You've had the joint replaced. You can have it replaced again at some point, but you can't do anything else. You've had that joint, that's known as a terminal treatment. What we do here is not a terminal treatment. After we've injected the tissue or the joint with PRP or stem cells, you can go on to surgery. Heck, you can go on to joint replacement if you feel you needed to. Or you can go back to physical therapy and work some more. So your options are no longer, they're not being limited here. So, uh, you know, if, if what we do doesn't work out for you, surgery is always waiting. And trust me, surgery is always there. There is, it, it is rare that you need to rush to surgery. And that concludes my presentation this evening. Thank you very much. I'll leave you with this. Uh, schedule an evaluation. And now if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to try and answer them. Can this procedure work on the spine? Uh, Melody asks, yes, absolutely it can. I'm fellowship trained in spine and sports medicine. And uh, because I am, I uh, inject uh, every joint in the body, including the neck and the back. Uh, and it's similar, your, your spine is nothing but a series of joints. Uh, 
So it's very similar to uh, injecting any other joint in the body. You just have to have the training to be able to do it. And I do. So yes. Um, and uh, anybody who's trained in these techniques, who's also trained in spine, uh, can inject uh, PRP and uh, stem cells into the spine. Uh, Melody, even when the nerves are being pinched. Yes, even when the nerves are being pinched, we can inject into the spine. In fact, <clears throat> we have a small study that shows that uh, steroid epidurals don't work nearly as well or last nearly as long as platelet epidurals. Uh, and I do a lot of those in my practice, a lot. We have a question from Anonymous. How painful are all these injections? Is the patient awake? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, they're, they're, uh, we use anesthetic grade needles through the skin, but that doesn't mean you don't feel a, a pinprick. Uh, we sedate you with oral uh, meds, and then I'll do a, a local block of, of nerves, depending on what I'm working on. Um, so yeah, you do feel something. Um, it's, it's not as if you, you have a nice little sleep and you wake up and it's all done. Um, that's not the way it works, because quite often I need your cooperation, so I need you awake. Uh, so yeah, you feel something. Uh, it's not terribly painful. I know it sounds awful, particularly with stem cells, harvesting stem cells from the bone marrow. Sounds terrible. And everybody who comes to my office and I tell them that's what we need to do. They just, you know, shudder. I, I tell you, I've done uh, many, many hundreds of bone marrow aspirations. I've had it done on myself three times. It's not painful if you know how to do it, if you do it correctly, if you numb the skin, the deeper subcutaneous tissues, and then most importantly, if you numb the cortical bone, I can get into bone and get bone marrow. doesn't hurt. Uh, Melody has another question. Uh, she has loss of feeling in her feet. Uh, we can address that. It really kind of depends on how long you've had that feeling. Uh, Anonymous has another question. Is it covered by insurance? No, no, it's not covered by insurance. This is uh, brand new. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, as a result, uh, most commercial insurances are not paying for these procedures. Now, we have highly motivated uh, insurers, including workers' compensation. They uh, tend to pay me for these um, uh, procedures because they know quite often that surgery is wildly expensive and often doesn't work, and they would like to try something different. So uh, I have uh, lucky patients in my office who are workers' comp patients who get insurances to pay for these treatments. Otherwise, it's a, you know a, a cash in a barrel head type procedure, and this is something uh, that I didn't address in my uh, presentation tonight, which I'd like to address now. Is you need to be very, very, very careful about who you see because this still is a cash in a barrel head procedure. You want to make sure that you're talking to a medical doctor. If you're talking to a medical doctor then chances are very, very, very high that you're talking to a legitimate practitioner who knows how to do this, who has training in doing this. And unfortunately, there's quite a few of us, uh, there's not that many of us uh, at this point in time. Conversely, there's lots of people who are trying to separate you from your money. And what they're doing is fraudulent. They have no training in this. Uh, they're injecting you with little vials of stuff they claim to be stem cells, which are not. They're charging you exorbitant amounts to do this. Uh, quite often, people who are charging you this can't even do this procedure themselves, and they hire a nurse to come in and inject, say, a knee or a shoulder, but they have no training. They have no advanced training in doing these techniques. So you need to be very, very, very careful about who you see in this uh, in this regard. Uh, the the, the take-home advice would be make sure you're talking to a medical doctor, not a doctor of chiropractic, a medical doctor, an MD. That's very important. Uh, other questions, uh, anonymous, how quickly can you feel relief? That's a great question. You need to keep in mind uh, that these are injections that are trying to stimulate a repair process. Uh, tissue change is how repairs, you know, you're taking damaged tissue and you're trying to change it back into healthy tissue. Tissue change time begins two to four weeks after we do a platelet injection. It begins eight to 12 weeks after we do a bone marrow procedure, which is a stem cell procedure. So roughly you're talking, you know, month to month and a half or three to six months after we do something like this. And that's, you know, I got to tell you, as a guy who does this in patients, it's, uh, uh, that's usually the hardest part of the procedure is waiting for the effect to occur. Um, 
but it's so wonderful when it does. It really is. So uh, yeah, patience is required. Keep that in mind. This is not something you do on a Tuesday and two weeks from Tuesday, you're feeling fantastic. Uh, it's possible to feel uh, better quickly. And that's because we can change the chemical microenvironment inside, uh, say, an arthritic joint. And you can feel better quite literally within days. But that's just the first phase. And that's really not the phase we're looking for. We're looking for the tissue change phase. And that takes time. So keep that in mind. Uh, anonymous costs. Yeah, rough costs. Uh, uh, platelet procedures uh, start around $1,200. They can go up as high as $2,500, $3,500. Uh, stem cell procedures ballpark is around $5,000. But depending on what we need to do, they can go as high as six, seven, eight. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th and those are ballparks. And, we, you know, there's not, uh, we don't offer a standard, you know, stem cell. It really depends on what I have to do. And that depends on what's wrong. Uh, so I need to evaluate you. I need to look at your imaging. Uh, if you haven't got enough imaging, I need to order more and develop a treatment plan for you. And how this works is then I send you, you know, once I decide I know what's wrong with this tissue or with your joint, uh, I put it all together into a proposal, which I send you at your home uh, via an email. And it breaks down what the doctor needs to do and exactly what that costs you, line item by line item. And then, uh, you know, we ask patients to call if they have any questions. The one thing we don't do, and this needs to be kept in mind, is we are medical doctors doing this. We're not used car salesmen. So there's no point of sale pressure. We don't twist anybody's arm to do these procedures, and we never want to be accused of twisting arms. That's why if you come into my office, I give you a complete evaluation. I order what I need to make sure I know what's wrong. And when I have a good diagnosis, then I will send you a proposal of what I think needs to be done. Now, before that time, I will treat you with your insurance. I will work you up. In other words, I will examine you. I will look at your films and order more films and all through your insurance, getting your insurance to pay for that. It's only when we step away to a, you know, a recommendation, if I have one, about doing a PRP or a stem cell procedure. It's only then that we're no longer talking about insurance coverage. And it's at that point that I send you the proposal and you have, a, of course, plenty of time to consider the proposal in private, call us with questions and decide, do you want to do this or do you not want to do this? Uh, let's see, who do we have here? Connie has a question. Can this be used for a patient with psoriatic arthritis or other autoimmune diseases? If so, would PRP or stem cell uh, be better with autoimmune disease? That's an excellent question. And yes, I happen to treat lots of people with autoimmune diseases. Amongst them, psoriatic arthritis, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis. Yes, yes, we do. Does this cure them of these pro-inflammatory diseases? Absolutely not. No, it doesn't. And it's something that we tend to do again and again and again. It can be very, very helpful. And it can slow down the absolute destruction of joints that occurs in these pro-inflammatory autoimmune diseases. So it can be helpful. It's not a cure by any stretch. Uh, so, you know, we're not claiming that. But I've treated lots of rheumatic uh, shoulder pain, knee pain. Uh, we also treat uh, people who have what is known as EDS, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. This is a genetic uh, deficiency in connective tissue. So that these the people who have this have very springy, stretchy ligaments that creates instability in joints, and they got a lot of joint pain. They come to me for prolotherapy. We inject their joints and ligaments and uh, uh, their tendons, and we tighten up a joint. We get greater instability for them, and they feel a lot better. I have a lot of those patients. They come back time and again. Uh, Anonymous has another question. And what is the percentage of success of these procedures? Well, that's a great question. And it really depends on what it is we're treating. It really depends on what it is we're treating. But I'll tell you this, we have enough data that tells me um, where I place a candidate. And anybody who comes into my office I, gets placed into one of three basic buckets, poor, fair, or good. Uh, and we feel that if you're into the poor category, we sort of advise you, hey, you know, probably don't do this uh, because your chances of success are less than 30%. And what that means, less than 30% chances of success means every time, every 10 times we try to treat you, seven times we will fail. Those are not good odds. And if you fall into that bucket, and there are criteria for that, which I can't go into now, I do do a, a webinar that explains all these criteria, and maybe I'll do it again soon. Um, but every 
patient that I see gets put through, you know, that process where I decide, you know, how good a candidate are you? And if you're a poor candidate, you know, I, I, I tell you, I tell you, you're a poor candidate. Uh, chances are not good. And yet I do do a presentation where I show for every joint in the body, somebody I told they were a poor candidate for this and they wanted to do it anyway. We went ahead and we did it and they had a success. Now, these are exceptions to the rule. I just like to show the fact that, yeah, the doctors can be wrong. And if you want to try it, you try it. Because the beauty part is there's very little risk to these procedures. And like I told you earlier, these are not terminal procedures. You do them, it doesn't reduce your chances for success with any other procedure you wish to try. And that's an important concept. Very important concept. So if you fall into the fair category, we think you have a, a success rate somewhere between 30 and 60%. And if you fall into the good category, we think you have at least a 60% chance and probably better, meaning every six to seven times we try this, we're going to succeed. We'll only fail three times. You have to remember there's no guarantees in medicine. So uh, we can't guarantee you success. But I'll tell you, it's it's not often that people come back after doing these procedures and tell me that they're not better at all. It has happened. And it does happen. But people are almost always better. The real question is, how much better? Are you better enough? That we don't know. And here's another uh, thing I can tell you. Quite often when we're dealing with just PRP, even sometimes with stem cells, we need to do it more than once. Often we'll do a stem cell and in three months they come back and say, well, it's a little better, but not. And I'm thinking, OK, let's do a platelet booster. So we'll just draw some blood, get some platelets, and we'll go back in and we'll, 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 we'll boost it. And quite often that's enough to get everything back on track to this healing process again. Um, so there's, you know, there's subtleties of, of, of treatment, uh, all of which go towards, you know, uh, trying to get you better. Um, I hope that answers uh, everybody's question. Another one from an anonymous. What is the percentage of success of these procedures? Oh, well, we just talked about that. Um, published data. There are there are studies, and they're growing every day. We have lots of studies that show uh, PRP and bone marrow are uh, successful. So, you know, when you hear from your orthopedic surgeon that the verdict is out, that's really not true. We have uh, more studies on these procedures now uh, than we do on some of the standard orthopedic surgeries we do. Uh, because they've been so, you know, every, people are jumping into the space because clearly it's a it's a newfangled way to treat arthritis and orthopedic injuries. And it can be very, very successful. And it can reduce the need to have surgery. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing because, you know, surgery, as I emphasized in my presentation, does come at a cost. Um, so if you can avoid it, and this is one way that we often can avoid surgery by doing these procedures, uh, it's something that you, you, you need to consider doing. Um, people ask me, what are the risks? Risks are very low. They're on the level of, uh, of a steroid injection in a doctor's office. You stick a needle into the joint and inject steroids. I would suggest that uh, the risks of doing an orthobiologic injection, because we're not using steroids, is probably not as risky because steroids suppress the immune system. They make you more uh, vulnerable to infections. Infections are the primary risk of doing procedures like this, depending on where we're doing it. You do them in the spine, and of course, the risks are much greater. Even so, they're far less than surgery. Uh, anonymous, I have one more question. If a patient is on Plavix, how does this affect the platelet draw? It doesn't affect the platelet draw at all. Uh, it slightly increases your risk of bleeding, depending on what it is we're doing. Uh, ideally, you'd come off the Plavix for six, seven days before, but I can't tell you to do that. You have to have a discussion about doing that with the doctor prescribing the Plavix. Uh, and if that doctor doesn't feel comfortable with allowing you to do that, we can still go ahead and do a procedure because I'm using anesthetic grade needles. Uh, because you're on Plavix, you have an increased risk of bleeding. Is that going to be terminal? No. This is why there's always a trade-off. Some people on Plavix, the doctors who prescribe the Plavix don't want you to stop that Plavix because theoretically, if you stop the Plavix, you could throw a blood clot to the brain or the heart, which could kill you. That would be a terrible outcome. What's the risk of me doing a procedure while you're on Plavix? Bleeding. Is that going to kill you? Absolutely not. So it's relative risk. 
so no, it's not a, that's not a hard no if you're on Plavix and you can't come off of it. We can still do a procedure. Uh, any other questions? Uh, well, I've had fun. I hope you've uh, found this informative. And uh, again, if you have any uh, uh, desire, please give us a call. I uh, would love to uh, give you my uh, opinion about what's bothering you and uh, tell you what I think I can do for you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out. Appreciate your time.